nice. So like there's a <laughs> tunnel behind us. So tonight we um, <clears throat> began celebrating St. Nectarios of Aegina, and it's, um, it's interesting, you know, there, there are a, a finite number of saints who are included in the great intercessory prayers at Matins. O God, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Visit with thy world with mercies. Right? Remember that if you come to Matins, that you hear that big full page prayer <coughs> on Sunday. And um, St. Nectarios is on that. He's on the list. He's on the list. There's a finite number of people mentioned on that list, but he is commemorated on that list. St. Nectarios has made a huge impact on orthodoxy. It's huge. And the ironic thing is that he is a disgraced bishop. If you think about that for a minute. <laughs> that he was a bishop <clears throat> who was uh, who was lied about and who was basically framed yeah. and he was cast out. He was relieved of his duties as bishop and sent to Athens and he got there and there were already, by the time he got there, right, there was no internet at the time, there were already rumors, all sorts of rumors of um, uh, immorality, <clears throat> of him living in a immoral lifestyle, like the evil one <clears throat> wanted to take this man out. So he gets there to Athens and there's no work for him. So he's been relieved of his duties as the bishop in Alexandria. He is sent to Athens. He has nothing. He gets there. And there's rumors everywhere about him. Lies were told. And so he has nothing. Just think about that for a second. <clears throat> Just think about that for a second. The thought that uh, if anybody had a reason to be angry, to lash out, to defend himself, to seek justice for himself, if anybody had the right, it is this righteous and holy man who was there giving away all that he had in Alexandria to the poor. The people loved him. And he is slandered, and he loses everything. <clears throat> and why did they do this to him, by the way? Just a side note. They did this because they were jealous. These other men, these other bishops, it's hard for us to imagine, <clears throat> especially as new converts, when we start to think, well, oh, wow, so we've got the successors of the apostles, these wonderful, holy, righteous, nearly perfect men working miracles. You know, we'd like to, we love to think about our bishops like that. I mean, our, our bishops are, I mean, I'm biased perhaps, but <clears throat> I mean, our bishops are pretty special bishops. If you know our bishops, you know what I'm talking about. Our bishops are very special. Um, but not all bishops in the world are like that. It's really hard to s stomach that, to hear the story of St. Nectarius and hear that there are bishops that are lying about him because they're jealous and don't want him to get the power that they want. That's crazy. But unfortunately, <clears throat> the devil even tempts the bishops, and some of them give in to the temptation. But ours are great. And there's a lot of holy, wonderful bishops out there. Hopefully, I can say most of them are. But the ones in this story had trouble. <clears throat> so St. Nectarios then is destitute. He, as I remember, it's been a number of years since I read the full book, but I think he lived in a little one-room thing over someone's garage. <coughs> correct? Do I remember that correctly? Uh, over a, a, a garden shed or something. I mean, basically, just absolutely impoverished. He had very little money, almost no money to eat. The money he had, he spent it on coffee. He drank coffee, and he wrote, and drank coffee, and he wrote, and he... Um, he, 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 for him, this coffee was so important to him. I think that's funny. I don't drink a lot of coffee, actually. People think 
I think sometimes they think I do because I talk about coffee a lot. I actually you only used drink. To, Father. What was that? You used. To. I I did. I used to. Yes, I did. It used to be my fuel. <clears throat> but now I'd say probably I, maybe I drink a couple of coffee, a couple of cups of coffee a day. That's what Saint Icarius's nuns drink, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. But but for for uh, one of the one of the reasons that I I, I love talking about Saint Icarius's coffee uh, affinity is because for him it was it was something warm comforting, refreshing, if you will. It, it was, he had so few pleasures in life, but he knew that he could make himself a cup of coffee and continue to write his theological works, which are <coughs> phenomenal, by the way. Uh, uh, not many are translated yet into English. But as they get translated, then you know we'll, we'll keep adding them to our library. Um, if you don't know, <coughs> St. Nectarios wrote hymns. He loved the Theotokos more than just about anything. Uh, and he, he wrote the song that we sang as we were leaving the church, Oh, rejoice, O oh, unwedded bride. Absolutely beautiful melody. Uh, the words are phenomenal, and he, was, he loved to write about uh, Jesus' mother. So St. Nectarios then uh, eventually gets a job as a, a traveling preacher, filling in preaching. And... <clears throat> The rumors went before him, and people uh, did not receive him warmly, at least at first. Very sad to think that you devote your life completely and wholly to God, he tonsured a monk, devotes his life to service in the church, and here he finds himself in Athens being either ignored at best or abused at worst. <coughs> well, eventually he gets a job <coughs> as the dean at the Rosario School, and uh, he, 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 he led with his humble example of sanctity. He just he devoted himself <coughs> to <coughs> serving as Christ served. Jesus, you know, the foot washer. That's how St. Nectarios served. And um, it was scandalous for some people. They didn't understand. Uh, they thought that he should be spending less time on all of the spiritual stuff and more time on helping these students to be prepared for real life. You know. And for him, he, he knew he was trying to prepare them for real life and for eternal life far more important than his temporal life. So St. Nectarios, uh, after working there for a number of years, I think maybe it was 14 or 15 years, doing things like you know, scrubbing the floors in the bathrooms. He did this not because that was part of his job description, but because he was willing to do anything he could to help anybody else. That's, that's what the saints do. They wash feet, they scrub toilets, they do the difficult stuff, they do what's needed. They're not worried about getting their pretty little soft hands dirty in a toilet. They wash them with soap before they go to serve at the altar. You know. St. Nectarios knew this. <clears throat> Eventually he goes and he starts a, uh, a women's monastery. He's the spiritual father of a women's monastery on the island of Aegina. And um, he moves out there eventually to serve, you know, as the resident um, clergy in the monastery. And even then, after living such a righteous life, doing everything for everyone else, even there, the scandals, the, the accusations of scandals followed him. Everything was eventually proven false. <clears throat> but this man never complained. He just didn't complain. He took it, like St. Macarius of Egypt. The famous story of St. Macarius of Egypt is the first story about St. Macarius of Egypt. <laughs> You've heard it before. I chuckle because it's so hard. These things, these stories are so hard. We say, how do we do this? St. Macarius, you know, he was living in this village, and there was a girl in the village, and she became pregnant, and her father said, who was it? And she 
and said, it was the holy man. And, you know, so they drug St. Macarius in there. Said, what do you have to say for yourself? He didn't defend himself. And so they, you know, beat him up and told him, you know, you're going to have to take care of her. And he says, he does some stuff off. He says, okay, Macarius, I guess you found yourself a wife. He was a monk. But he didn't say, it wasn't me. He didn't defend himself. He just went to work and started earning money and giving it all to the woman. Because after all, she was going to be a mom and she had to be taken care of. So he goes through the whole, the, the whole nine months and she's in labor, 36 hours, 48 hours. Pretty soon she starts to lose it. She realizes, I'm not having this baby because God is punishing me because I lied about it tells her father, it was the baker, it wasn't the holy man. And so, anyway, she gives birth immediately, and they all go off to thank Macarius and to tell him how sorry they are, and how proud of him they are, and how what a wonderful man he is. And somebody told him that they were coming, and he took off running into the desert, and they never heard from him again. This is the life that St. Macarius, that St. Macarius lived. But he lived it while we have jets flying over, and you know, uh, while we have uh, modern everything, like, like in the modern day, you know, he's living this way in our modern age. <clears throat> it's one thing for us to think about St. Macarius living out in some dusty village on the other side of the world, right? And then, you know, escaping to a cave where he silently battles the demons in the name of Christ, and we go, ooh, that sounds great. But then the St. Nectarios living in a garden shack with only enough money to drink coffee and, you know, being rejected by everyone, being slandered. I mean, it's, it's, it, this is our modern age we're talking about. So why is he on that great general intercession that we, that we pray at Matins? Because you heard in the hymns tonight, if we listened, that he lived like the great ascetics of old. He was like St. Anthony the Great. He was like St. Macarius the Great. You know, he was like St. Paul of Thebes. He was like Abba Pombo, except for he lived in the modern time in the city. There are a number of these stories of saints, you know. I mean, I, I, I should have brought some with me. I, I, I didn't. But, uh, but I've been reading, you know, I've been reading through the, some of the 800 pages of, of quotes of the fathers, you know, that we got from the internet. <clears throat> There's a website. I don't remember what it is. You can look for it. It's hard to find. You won't find it. You have to know where to dig and what to ask for. But anyway, <clears throat> he gives all of these quotes of the fathers. And I realized why, you know, they picked some of them out and they put them in books and then we sell the books in the bookstore. Like, you know, 120, 150, 200 pages. Some of them are kind of similar to others. And I remember um, this one this one, there was, I think it was Abba Pamba, but I can't remember, who, you know, he was praying one day, and he was starting to feel alone. And this happened with a number of different saints out in the desert. He started to kind of feel like he didn't have a peer, like he didn't have a companion. He said, Lord, who is there? Is there anybody else in the world that's like me? Lord, help me to see. And so the Lord said, oh, yes, there is a man. <clears throat> he is a former robber, and he lives in Alexandria. And... Uh, and, and this is how you'll find him. And, and, and monks, that's not a really impressive uh, resume. I'm going to go find out what's, what's up with this guy. And so he goes out. And listen to this story. So this monk who'd been living in the desert, praying his whole life, goes to the city. And he finds this man. <clears throat> and he goes to him. And he says, uh, hi, I'm, I'm wondering, can you tell me anything about your life? And the man says, yeah, I've lived a really bad he said, well, what do you mean, uh, how do you mean really bad? What have you done? He says, well, he says, uh, I spent most of my life as a thief. I would just steal from people. I just took things that didn't belong to me. He says, really? He says, well, have you ever done anything good? He says, no, I've never done anything good at all. He says, actually, there was one time that I was out, and we were all, you know, we, we were all, you know, going to steal stuff and raid, and he said that, we came to this, uh, this, this house, and there was this, uh, you know, this nun, this hermitess living in there. 
and the men with me decided that you know they were going to have their way with her. He said, I stood in the way, I stood in the door, and I said, you will not go anywhere near her. And he said, it was hard, he said, but I fought them all off. He said, I, I, I did do that, I did that one time. And then I decided I didn't want to be a thief anymore. And the, the, the monk was just shocked. He was just shocked. We hear these stories so much, you know, I think it was with St. Anthony the Great, who the guy, uh, he said, Lord, is there anybody like me in the world? And he said, there is one, there's a, a doctor in the city. In the city, and he says yes. He says, you know, he's yeah, he's he, he, he's like you in his relationship with me. He says, in the city, I've got to go see this man. So he goes to see them, see him, and he says to the doctor, he says, can you tell me anything about your life? And the man says, yeah, I, nothing special. I'm a doctor. And he says, well, there must be something. He says, just tell me privately, what is it that you do? You know, what what is your what is your regimen? And he says, well, and he says. Well, the money that I make, you know, I keep just what I need, and then the rest I distribute to the poor. And anybody who can't afford to be treated by me, I just treat them for free. And I just say my prayers. Just a very simple answer. And there are so many different versions of this kind of story. And the point is, the point, the point that I want to make, and then I'm going to close with this and open up for questions. The point I want to make is that... <clears throat> St. Nectarios did what those saints in the desert did in the city. We can't say, well, you know, if only I were living as a hermit. I mean, try it sometime. Go pitch a tent on the limestone back there in the back with nobody around and pray. Do it in the summer when the mosquitoes are out. And, and see how long you make it as an anchorite in the limestone piles out there. Because I'm going to tell you, it's probably not going to really go very well. It's not going to go really well. If we can't start to live a righteous and holy life where we are, then changing our location is not going to solve anything. The demons will pack up and come with us. They'll say, hey, we like limestone. Our copperheads out there. That's just that. Those are our peeps, right? The whatever it is that we, wherever it is that we are planted, that's the place where God says, "These are the things that you need to work on." I've, I've placed you surrounded by these struggles in life. These are the things for you to work on. <coughs> this is what I want you to do to be saved. As they say in our modern vernacular, "Bloom where you're planted." If that is a spiritual charge from Christ himself to us, say, where you are, that is where you are to become a saint. <clears throat> and St. Nectarios did that in Athens. Uh, St. Porphyrios did it was he in Athens as well. Anybody remember where St. Porphyrios was? Was he in Athens? It was a big city. I think it was Athens. We have these saints who did it in the cities. And uh, I, I think that that's a gift from God for us. You know, these hymns talk about the saint in our modern times. That, I think it really is a gift from God for us to say, everybody wake up. You don't have to be in a cave in the desert. You can become what I've created you to be right where you are. But the devil wants us to make excuses for ourselves. He really does. He wants us to say, yeah, that, that, that sanctity is for somebody else. That asceticism, that's, that's for somebody else. It's true that these guys who are out here who are eating a piece of Prospera over a period of a week or whatever they're doing, you know, it's true. We're probably not going to ever get to that place where we take home our holy bread on Sunday and we make it last until Saturday night. Probably we're not going to do that because that's not our gifting and our calling. That's, that's not where we are. But what we are called to do is to live a life that is virtuous, to love God above all, and to love our neighbor as ourself, and to struggle to grow to be holy, sanctified, set apart, different than what the world expects us to be. The world does not ex did not expect St. Nectarius to scrub toilets or do any of those other things as a bishop. They didn't expect that of him. Right? The world expects us to be harsh or 
uh, self-interested or money-grabbing or envious of our neighbors or coveting of this or that. The world has different expectations for us. But God said, I put you here in this house, in this neighborhood, in this parish, in this city, and I'm giving you everything you need to become the person I've created you to be. That's what St. Icarius tells us, and what St. Porphyrios tells us, and some of the other great saints and ascetics who lived in the city, like we do. So anyway, that's all I had to share with you about that, and if anybody has any questions or comments, I'm happy to open the floor. Yes, Hannah Nor. What if you move? What if you move? It's a good question. So the fathers tell us, Never move unless you have to. Don't move unless you have to. There's a good reason for that. It's because when we're moved, typically we think, if only I can move, then things will get better. But what we find when we get to the next place is there are a lot of the same exact problems we had at the previous place. Now, if you move and things get better, glory to God. Stay there. Um, but if we have to move, an example of having to move, sometimes you have to move. Sometimes your house is falling apart. It's not safe for your children. It's, it's doing bad things to your health, whatever. Um, but but it's the, the saints tell us to stay where we are as much as possible because that's where we are planted and that's where we are being saved. Good question. And it's not like if you move, like, oh, you lost your chance. God is going to be with you in the next place you are. But as I said with the, the fathers, you know, there, there was that the story. I can never remember when I told what stories, so if you heard this last week, forgive me. But the story of the monk who is in his cave, and he says, if only I can get out of here. This place is driving me crazy, right? And so he goes to pack his stuff, and he looks, and he sees the devil packing a bag in the corner. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm coming with you. <laughs> you know, and so the guy unpacks his bag and goes to his prayer corner and starts praying. So, anyway, those are hard stories because we, we want to think the American dream, if only I can become CEO of this and have this in my bank account and have uh, my, my spouse that looks like this and drive this car and have a yacht and take six vacations a year, then everything will be great. But you know what? Try talking to those people. Those people aren't happy. That's not happy. Except for Tom. Tom. <laughs> Tom is Andrew. He's got all that, and he's as happy as a clam. I'm happy as a clam in a surf. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to an NFL player. Father just brought him to memory. I was in college. There used to be a group called the Power Team, and they were pro athletes around the world. And if you Google them back in the day, they would symbolize when they talked. They would go to schools all around the world. And I, and I would, when God touched me in college, I, I could not... I don't know what happened. I just couldn't get enough scripture. So I'm just out of high school, a little bit after I came down to Bloomington. God spoke to me in a, a, a certain way, and I dropped everything in the world, and I, I couldn't get enough scripture. So I was clicking in my dorm room, and I, I didn't read the Bible before I went to, to uh, college. I mean, yeah, I did in school. I had to at Catholic school. Don't get me wrong, but I wasn't reading it when I'm off work. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm flipping through the channels, and then I see Power Team. These are guys. One was Mr. Belgium, the, the bodybuilding champ of Belgium. Another one was in L.A. back then. It was called the L.A. Raiders, an NFL team, and a bunch of pro athletes. So one day they were coming to Bloomington. I'm like, Lord, I was at the college mall in, in college here, and I went there, and I said, Lord, please, I'd like to meet these guys. And I'm walking out the door, and a woman walks by me and brings up this Power Team thing. And I said, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, wow, the Lord's giving me a shot. I'm so happy to do this, right? Well, she's like, you can go and be there like by security. So I'm driving around the power team in Bloomington like that. And I'm talking to the L.A. Raider. We're going to schools around the area, and I'm their assistant. So I'm driving him around. This guy's a pro NFL player, big. I mean a monster. He could lift a Volkswagen, right? And I did what you said. What you said. I was talking to him. I go, I want to go do this. I want to serve God and be a, a minister like Morris Cirillo, who wanted to save a million people before he died. I want to be someone important to God because I want to be on God's team. I love him. And this NFL player looked, and he said, you can go wherever you want to go. Keep in mind, a millionaire football player, athlete on TV, he said, you could go wherever you want you're going to be the same one you are right here in Bloomington. You're not going to change. 
no matter where you go. And he mirrored exactly what the father is, what you said. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? A millionaire TV football star that all the kids dream of. What do you want to do? I'm going to be a pro athlete. A lot of guys in the inner city. He had it and he said, you're looking, you will not be, nothing will change. And that was coming from an elf. I had to tell you that, from an I NFL player. So I just wanted I, to echo, shout out to hey, you after you call me a happy clam. I, I had to jump out of my surf. I used to go see the power team in Alaska. Come on. I did. You never told me about I that. Did. They were ripping their phone books. Do you remember so that? Oh, yeah. John Jacobs. Hey, yeah, you got it. Yeah. He snapped handcuffs. He would have police come in, and they would handcuff him, and this guy would snap the handcuffs off, and he said, in Jesus, all the chains of the enemy will come off you in Christ. And that was their message to the youth. It was, it was a really... It That's was a really, cool. Yeah, it was a really I didn't know you saw that. It's the first oh, yeah. time we ever talked about that. that? Hey. two or three times. So, yeah, awesome. but it was a really cool idea. These guys, these guys <laughs> had almost superhuman strength. They were just, I mean, their arms were just, I mean, unbelievable. just huge. And they would come and they would do these incredible feats. And all the young people wanted to come and see them because they were really, it was really cool. And then once they had your attention, they would tell you about Christ. Yes. It's a really cool. I didn't, really, wow, cool. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know that. we had that in common. We do. Now I really feel special. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. I also saw the power team, so... Come on, you're kidding! Have that come How up. cool! But, moving on, um, <laughs> my question is, so Orthodox churches in, are not everywhere. Right. So if someone wanted to become Orthodox, but they were nowhere near Orthodoxy, would it still be something that we, we wouldn't want them to move? So that's a good question. So what the fathers are talking about when they say don't move unless you have to, they're, keep in mind that they're generally speaking to the monks out in the desert. That's generally who they're speaking to. Or people who come to them with problems from the city and say, my neighbor, my neighbor is doing such and such, and it's really, really hard. And they'll say, listen, your neighbor's there for your salvation. Don't move from that. You figure out how to be saved by loving your neighbor as yourself. So it's not like they're saying, oh, you want to be Orthodox? Don't move near to an Orthodox church. That's a, that's, it's a different context. Okay. Good question. But, um, uh, but, but just along that line, I know of people, and I don't recommend this, but I know of people who you know, lived somewhere, they had to live there for their job or their whatever, they were taking care of an elderly parent or whatever, and they end up starting a church, you know? So, which is not really related to your question, but that sometimes, you know, God puts you in a place where you seemingly can't move because he says, I want you to do something right here, you know? <coughs> so anyway. One never knows, but that's why we, 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 we approach everything with uh, prayer and fear and trembling. And, and now you ask your spiritual father. That's what we're here for. So, yes, David. Uh, just <clears throat> some quick comments about uh, the what you're saying for uh, St. Nectarios. Yes. The fact that <clears throat> a lot of people were uh, bad-mouthing him and uh, uh, slandering his name and whatnot. They wouldn't be doing that unless God would uh, tell them to do that in the first place. So it's all his plan. It, well, no, I, I will disagree with one point, and that is that God allows it. God God isn't planting s slander of his holy saints in their heart, no. but he does certainly allow them to do that because you're absolutely right. What they intended for <coughs> evil, God intended to be used for good. But it's part of his, it's all part of his plan. Right. We wouldn't have a St. Nectarios, probably, that looks the way that St. Nectarios looks if he just went on to be a bishop wherever in whatever place. He could have gone on to be this great, uh, you know, a, a great, humble, ascetic, wonderful, miracle working bishop. It's entirely possible. But through his sufferings, he became something of a beacon for us in, in the modern world, now the postmodern world, that we need so desperately. So, yeah, I mean, in that sense, I think, look at uh, St. Cosmas the Aetolian or any other number of the saints whose uh, <coughs> spiritual greatness was born in the midst of oppressive adversity. You know, I mean, so, you know, so we have so many saints who rose up in that way, much like Joseph in Egypt, right? Uh, being sold into slavery and going to be the second pow most powerful man in the whole country. And then... I, want, I could tell the whole story. It only took about 20 years. That's right. Yes, ma'am? How did the rumors spread so quickly? That's a good question. So, yeah. So, so um, you've got 
port cities and you've got ships going from here to there, that's how they got things all over the world at that time. And so um, it's, it's similar to in the early church how Arianism spread. Arianism was the false teaching that Jesus is not the only begotten Son of God. He was the highest creature, but he's not the Son of God. And so Arius would write songs that would reflect his theology. He would go to the bars and teach the, the sailors at the bars how to sing his songs, and they'd sing his songs, and he was so good at writing poetry and songs. And then they would go to the next city, and they would teach everybody there these songs. And so he spread the heresy through song. And one thing is I loved about a Saint Ephraim the Syrian, it, he, he was not a happy man with, he did, was not happy about Arius and Arianism. And so he got together a choir of women, young women, and he taught them his hymns, which were orthodox. And he said, come on, we're going to the marketplace. And they would go to the market and sing these theological hymns, these orthodox hymns, in the middle of the marketplace. So he, he, gave, Saint, he gave Arius a little dose of his own medicine and ultimately, orthodoxy won out over the heresy of Arius. So the, the answer is, it would spread as the daily boats would go. You know, St. Nectarius, uh, after these uh, events started to transpire in Alexandria, I think he was still there for a couple of months, if I remember correctly. And then, uh, so that gave time for word to travel, mainly by boats. Question. Good news travels fast, bad news travels faster. That's right. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. So I noticed in a lot, <coughs> excuse me, in a lot of the hymns about Saint Nectarios tonight, mm -hmm. that there are a lot of comments about like he was a light in these latter days <coughs> or in these late days, which sounded almost a little like apocalyptic. Yeah, sure. And so I was just wondering if you could comment on that and sort of you know offer some remarks on how we should approach sort of like watching for the end times. Sure. So um, we've been in the end times for 2,000 years. Right? That's the long and the short of it. And the church says, live like every day is your last. And uh, since Christ ascended and the, the, the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost, we've been living in this, this final age. Uh, so there are certainly uh, many of the Holy Fathers of the more modern times who look and see what is happening in the world and see a fulfillment of some of the, um, uh, the prophecies, like in Revelation, for example. And they just they see the way that the political climate is moving, and um, they refer to these last days and these latter times, um, some with pretty great specificity. I've never used that word before. I've heard it. It sounds big. Specificity. Uh, so some of them with great specificity uh, about um, things that are happening, various things that are happening in the world. For example, um, boy, I was oh my goodness. Uh, do you remember the saint that was that was on the video I sent you the other night? The saint that was oh I can't remember his name. That's going to bother me now. I'll have to go back and find it. But he was talking about in the 1800s. Um, he was talking about the, um, the gender confusion and sexualization of children. He was talking about all this coming. And he was describing things in pretty great detail. And I was like, this can't be real. But actually, it is. It's, it was like 170 years ago, I think, that he's describing it, all of these things that would be leading up to the end. Now, leading up to the end doesn't mean tomorrow is the end. It could be another 100 years. We don't know, right? I mean, he was speaking 170 years ago, so obviously he wasn't talking about something that's coming in a week. But um, he was talking about things leading up to the end, just like Christ did. Jesus did the same exact thing. He said, this will happen, this will happen, but the end will not yet, you know, will not yet come. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And so the, 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 the teaching of the Orthodox Church is that we're always supposed to be approaching our time as though it is the end times. It is, these are the latter days. These are the last days. And prepare as though Christ will return any time. You know? Or that we, heaven forbid, will perish in a car crash on the way home. Right? God knows. We don't know. We're always supposed to be prepared in our <coughs> hearts to meet Christ. So that's, the, that's what I think they're, they're alluding to.
Yes, ma'am. Do. Is the name of the book you're thinking of the Shoes of St. Nectarios? Is that what it's called? Um, there, have you read that book? There is a children's book um, that talks about St. Nectarios as a child and the hardships that he endured as a child. Really, um, it's a spectacular book. Are you going to see if it's there? Korea, are you looking? Anyway, so there's that book, um, and, and it just gives <clears throat> colorful retellings of the stories that you can find in his own biography, uh, which is titled A Saint for Our Century. Um, so anyway, but the... It does? Yes. So what they did was took some of those childhood stories and made them into a children's book. And I think it's called St. Nectarius Shoes. I can't remember. Anyway, but yes. So the answer is yes. Do we have it here? I thought we used to have it, but I don't know. Is it in like the young adult orthodox? I think mom's looking. Because I haven't seen it there before. Well, we better get a copy or two then for the church. This is a good read. All right. Everybody's tired. Anybody else have anything else before we let you go off into the sunset? The sunset. Wait. Sunset was before Vespers tonight. No. This was strange. This is our first dark Vespers. I remember this well. Last question. Yes, ma'am. It, it was actually a real question. Oh, okay. What? It was, but it was really. Okay. More, more like for Askabuna? No. Okay. What is the question? Is there going to be snow on Saturday? I have no idea. <laughs> Let's check with Siri. No, we don't have that line in our thing. Really? And then we have this one, which has a little bit. Oh, good. Yeah, that has some good stories in it, too. Well, let's see, Hannah. It's 72 degrees right now at night in November. <laughs> and it looks like Saturday. Ooh, Saturday it's going down to 34 degrees at night, but no snow in the forecast. It's all right, everyone, let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we thank you for this time of fellowship together and teaching. We pray that you will set your angels as guards over each and every one of us. Help us to know, O oh Lord, that you are always near, as you've said to your apostles, and with you always, even at the end of the age. So also, O oh good Lord, who loves mankind, Help us all to know and to realize that you are with us and that you are uh, protecting us and that you are always blessing us. For you are holy together with your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and ever and under the ages of ages. Amen. Good night, everyone.